spirit of sacrifice and, and commitment that we just uh, heard about in the last session, I want to introduce uh, Mark Goldfeder, who is a senior lecturer at the Emory Law School and uh, uh, F F Sproul's family senior fellow at the Center for the Study of Law and Religion and a director of Law and Religion student programs at Emory. The Emory Law and Religion Center is uh, one of the oldest and, and perhaps one of the most successful law and religion centers in the United States. It's uh, been going on for about 30 years under great leadership and, and Mark is now a part of that. Um, he has made a tremendous sacrifice to be here with us. He's just traveled uh, 25 hours in one day uh, crossing time zones uh, in the air to be with us from Thailand and we're, we're very grateful that he would spend the time with us as we talk about ethics in representation. We just heard about um, the representation in uh, an important law and religion case and, and now Mark will discuss the ethical boundaries and things that we need to be careful of as we pursue cases large and small and other types of uh, representation. Let's all please welcome Mark Goldfeder. Uh, thank you very much for that. Let me just, sorry, get the screen on. It's on blank. Sorry? It's on the blank. Yeah, I think. I think if we take that. There it is. Okay, thank you. It was important to preface it about the Thailand issue. If any of you fall asleep, I'll understand. And again, if I fall asleep, please understand uh, <laughs> as well. Uh, the first thing I want to really say before we talk about ethics and law and religion, we need to talk about the very relationship between law and religion. At Emory, we like to say that religion gives law its spirit and inspires its adherence to ritual and to justice. And law gives religion its structure and encourages its devotion to order and organization. It's a very nice saying, very poetic, but it doesn't really answer a lot of the hard questions, such as uh, how an attorney who feels bound by two systems, by a personal religious system and by a secular non-religious, in this case American system, oftentimes with competing values, has to act when those uh, systems might come into conflict. So the very first question you need to ask, and I know we have a lot of non-lawyers in this room. The first question you need to ask is, do I want to be a lawyer? And the answer is maybe not. People who are always morally opposed to arguing a position contrary to their personal beliefs, as Andrew Perlman says, should probably find alternative careers that coincide more closely with their moral outlooks. So if you're not yet a lawyer, think twice before you become one. But maybe not. Suppose you do want to be a lawyer. And now you want to know how should my faith affect my practice? Is it ethical for me to do things that are against my personal belief system? Is it ethical for me to counsel my client about religious matters? Does faith affect the practice of law? And the answer is, of course it does, and of course it doesn't. That's the kind of question which is literally impossible to answer. I'm sorry. Okay. You know what, there is a walking mic. I, I pace, I'm sorry. I mean. Okay. Okay. And we're back. Sorry about that, people. Okay. Um, yes, it depends not only on your particular faith tradition, and different faith traditions have different answers. It depends on your personal understanding of your particular faith tradition in that particular aspect. The answer is maybe. And there are those who would argue that if Jesus himself was alive today, he'd be a defense attorney. And those who argue that, of course, he wouldn't because he wouldn't want to argue for those who might be guilty. There's all kinds of, you know, the most interesting kinds of panels are not the ones where they have a Jewish lawyer, a Christian lawyer, and a Muslim lawyer. It's when you have three Christian lawyers all arguing from the same perspective about whether you should or should not be a lawyer advocating certain positions or any other faith tradition. It's really an impossible answer to, to give. So depending, again, not only on your faith tradition, but on how you particularly understand it. But what about 
okay, you decide that in general you are comfortable practicing law and now there's a particular conflict that you're not sure how to handle. So I'll give an example that we talked about uh, in the earlier session in the Law and Religion Primer. Suppose that a landlord, for religious reasons, refuses to rent her apartment unit to an unmarried man and woman or fill in the blank, whatever lifestyle that they religiously think is uh, not a particularly good lifestyle. Is this housing discrimination? We pointed out that states may differ on that issue. It really may depend on where the apartment is. It depends on whether the state has adopted a RIFRA or whether that state follows strict scrutiny review. But what about if they now come to you and ask for representation? And you're an attorney who happens to agree with that landlord. And if it was your apartment, you also wouldn't want to rent it. Do you now have any kind of ethical duty to accept this representation? Is it discrimination if you turn it down and say, I don't want to represent you because, well, frankly, I don't agree with your lifestyle choices? Now, the model rules of professional conduct give us the following uh, rule in uh, 1.2b. A lawyer's representation of a client, including representation by appointment, does not constitute an endorsement of the client's political, economic, social, or moral views or activities. And for some people, and for some faith traditions, that's enough. Because essentially what that tells us is you don't have to agree, just do a good job as a lawyer and that's all you're being paid to do. Okay, and you can see how that might work for some people who can draw a line in their personal and professional lives and say that I do this as a lawyer, although I wouldn't necessarily do this in my particular um, faith tradition. That might work for some, but it might not work for others. Other people answer the question and say, I'll take the case, but I'll publicly let it be known that I don't believe in that cause. That might even be more problematic because you do have a duty. People do it. People do it. And you do have a duty to zealously represent your client. And there have been famous cases of black attorneys who are working for uh, the Klan. And they made statements saying, we do not do this because we believe in what the Klan is doing, but we do this as attorneys for the following few reasons. And they publicly make those kind of statements. And it's important to realize that's one way to do it. But again, you run into some other ethical quandaries because you do have the duty to represent your client zealously. And it's, it's hard to imagine that it's the full zealous representation when you're putting a little caveat saying, and also I don't actually agree. Um, but guess what? You're lucky in America because in general, in America, lawyers have the independence to decide which cases to take. And you can just say to them, no thank you. You don't have to go into if you want to be ethical about it. There's a lot of scholarship about when you're declining representation, what's the ethical way to do it? Is it more ethical to be honest and to say, I don't want to take this representation because I don't agree with this lifestyle? Or is it more ethical to uh, prevaricate and just say, I'm too busy that Tuesday? I'll leave that to you. There's no real good scholarship on it, but you do have the ability to walk away. There's one main exception, though, which is what happens when the court appoints you to be the lawyer, right? Every now and then a court will do this and say, you need to take this case. What do you do if there's a court appointment? Because in general, you can't get out of a court appointment unless there's very good reason. Rule 6.2 is a lawyer shall not seek to avoid appointment by a tribunal to represent a person except for good cause. And so the question is, huh? Is my desire not to represent a person in a housing discrimination case, is my desire to uphold my own moral or religious or ethical beliefs good cause to get out of a tribunal? Now let's read this rule very carefully. What constitutes good cause? Representing the client is likely to result in violation of the rules of professional conduct? Not likely. Okay. B. Representing the client is likely to result in an unreasonable financial burden? Not applicable. Or C, the client or the cause is so repugnant to the lawyer as to be likely to impair the client-lawyer relationship or the lawyer's ability to represent the client. Raise your hand if you think that works. Only a few of you? Okay. Let's take a look at the comment to that rule. A lawyer ordinarily is not obliged to accept a client whose character or cause the lawyer regards as repugnant. Now, Again, think about this in the following manner. One thing that a lawyer undoubtedly has to do is zealously represent their client. If a lawyer is coming to the court and saying, I don't think I can do this because I don't agree with the cause, what is a court likely to find? That they're not going to be able to zealously represent their client. And so 
it might feel odd from an ethical perspective to say that this is repugnant, I don't want to take the case, but on the other hand, on the flip side of the ethical conundrum, you have the duty to represent zealously, and if you can't, to walk away. And so it actually is fulfilling, according to many courts' understandings and ethical boards, your ethical responsibility in such a case to walk away. Courts have differed on this, although the majority of courts tend to say that that is the correct answer, and the short answer is, in general, a lawyer should decline employment even if it's a court appointment if his or her personal feeling may impair the effective representation of a prospective client and if not should be in violation of her ethical responsibility to zealously advocate for the client's position. And courts again tend to understand this. Take a look at uh, Indiana Planned Parenthood affiliates in the Seventh Circuit discussing Indiana's statutory scheme for judicially bypassing uh, parental consent for a minor's abortion. And the court said the minor certainly would not desire to seek the help of the family lawyer. One who was determined enough to walk into the office of an unknown lawyer would have no assurance that she would not be attempting to retain a counsel who had strongly held religious or moral beliefs about the wrongfulness of abortion. Now, the emphasis is mine, but presumably such an attorney would not accept the representation, thus causing further delay. And here's the important part. We, the court, would certainly expect an attorney who held such beliefs not to accept a court appointment. Okay, so important to realize that this is the case that normally comes up, that when you feel like you really can't represent the client, there is a way out built into the model rules. Um, Let's move on for a second. In general, you know, we mentioned this again earlier as well. In general, if your case is not about law and religion, in theory, religion shouldn't play such an important part at the trial. So if a religious organization files a paper, it gets processed like any other organization. If a religious person commits a tort or a crime, it's a tort or a crime. And that's nice in theory, but it's not always true. And I want to explore with you a few different things, a few different ways that religion can affect trial and how as an attorney uh, it is your job to be aware of these factors if you're going to zealously represent your client. Now why religion matters at trial is because it matters everywhere in life. It's often central to people's self-identity in ways that other factors are not. People define themselves that way. Most civil and criminal trials are neutral with regard to the majority of individual difference variables. They don't trigger or activate a person's uh, sense of group membership awareness in the same way that other factors do. So zealous representation means knowing how religion might affect your outcome. That is in terms of choosing the right jury, uh, knowing your judge, and knowing your client. Jury selection and religion in the process of jury selection. There are ethical ways to do this and unethical ways. Let's read a bit from Clarence Darrow's How to Pick a Jury. Beware of the Lutherans, especially the Scandinavians. They are almost always sure to convict. Either a Lutheran or a Scandinavian is unsafe, but if both in one, plead your client guilty and go down the docket. He, he learns about sinning and punishing from the preacher and he dares not doubt. A person who disobeys must be sent to hell. He has God's word for that. Ask the Unitarians, Universalists, Congregationalists, Jews, and other agnostics. Don't ask them too many questions. Yeah, do that in there. Keep them anyhow, especially Jews and agnostics. It's best to inspect a Unitarian or a Universalist or a Congregationalist with some care, for they may be prohibitionists, but never the Jews and the real agnostics, and do not, please, do not accept a prohibitionist. He is too solemn and holy and dyspeptic. He knows your client would not have been indicted unless he were a drinking man, and anyone who drinks is guilty of something, probably much worse than he's charged with, <laughs> although it's not set out in the indictment. Neither would he have employed you as his lawyer had he not been guilty. <laughs> so that doesn't sound like a super ethical way. This is written before you know, political correctness became a thing. But um, it is important. It is important to realize that you are allowed in a lot of states to uh, ask your, your, your during voir dire to ask about religion. Batson v. Kentucky, the court held that it was impermissible to exclude jurors based on race, but they declined to hear the next case. They declined to hear Davis uh, v. Minnesota, asking if this extended to religion. And so states are free to make their own independent rulings on this issue. And the truth is that we've come down uh, in a variety of different ways. Several states have what I'll call the lenient rule, Minnesota v. Davis, Minnesota Supreme Court held that religion-based challenges were fine because unlike 
racial minorities and women, religious minorities have not experienced the same level of discrimination in jury selection. In California, there was a case where I think 91% or 98% of Jews were being excluded from death penalty cases, so there are exceptions to this rule. But in general, there hasn't been the same level of discrimination in jury selection, so it doesn't raise the same kind of problems. Besides, the court said, forbidding religious challenges would unduly complicate the system. Other courts have set some restrictions. So for instance, religious characteristics. You can't um, talk about whether or, or set someone aside because the potential juror is religious, but you can if he or she attends church very often or never attends church at all. Religious characteristics can be probative even if the religion is not. Other states have what we'll call the intermediate rule from U.S. v. Stafford, the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals, held that it would be improper to challenge a juror on the basis of his or her particular affiliation, but it would be proper to challenge them based on their religion-based beliefs if said beliefs would impair the juror's ability to make a decision based on the evidence and the jury instructions. So, for example, it would be impermissible to remove a witness because of their religious affiliation, but it would be allowed if they were of the belief that it is not man's place to judge others and that therefore they wouldn't be participating fully in the deliberative process. Okay, a direct effect on the trial stemming, of course, from their stated religious beliefs, but not because of their affiliation alone. Some courts feel similarly about occupation. So in Indiana, for example, right, a Baptist minister could be excluded not because he's a Baptist, but because he is a minister. And it's a fine line distinction, but uh, that's the intermediate rule. Then we have the strict rule, New Jersey, which says, did you not see that Clarence Darrow quote? Was it not offensive to you? Attorneys may not exclude potential jurors for any reason related to religion, and there are 1st, 5th, 6th, and 14th Amendment challenges. So really we come down all over, all over, all over on this issue about whether or not you can, but if you're an attorney and you're selecting um, jurors, it makes a difference because take a look at this chart, take a simple, a simple position, take a position like death penalty, okay? You can fairly easily chart positions from various religions on this issue. And if you are selecting a jury to deal with an important case where your client's very life or liberty might be at stake, it certainly is part of your zealous representation to try and make sure that you get the most people on that jury you can who will most likely be effective. Okay? And it's important to realize as well, by the way, that these are absolutely uh, generalizations. And that, of course, you're going to find people of all religions that make all kinds of decisions for a variety of different reasons. But the fact is that studies have shown these to be somewhat accurate, and so it behooves you as an attorney in your zealous representation to pay attention of how it might uh, play out. The next thing you want to talk about, if you're going to talk about law and religion uh, at trial and how ethics and religion might, might play a factor, are, are the judges. And <coughs> We'll talk about this from a couple of different perspectives. The first perspective is, is it ethical for the judge to allow religion or religious thinking to affect his or her judicial decision making? Whether or not it's ethical, does it happen? And as an attorney, if it happens, do you have uh, the requirement to really be um, aware of it? And the answer is, it certainly does happen, whether or not it's ethical. Take a look at the uh, Supreme Court. There have been 12 different religions on the court. Most is 35 Episcopalians, and the only non-Christian justices have been Jewish. Now, when you think about whether it's ethical for religion to play a factor in judicial decision making, think about it in the context of a non-religious quote. Think about it in the context of Justice Sotomayor's famous quote about her own life experience. She famously said, and she got a lot of flack for this, but she famously uh, said, and she proudly um, stood up for this, that I would hope that a wise Latina woman with the richness of her experiences would more often than not reach a better conclusion than a white male who hasn't lived that life. I want to stop here and ask, what do you think she meant by that? Anyone? Any? Yeah. Essentially, she was saying that the experience of a Latina woman, woman somehow has greater precedence than the experience that a white male has. 
What do you mean by greater precedence? Well, that somehow it has more richness. Okay. Authority to make better decisions than what a white male would have. Okay. When any of us process or think about anything, when we read an opinion or a brief, we obviously refract it through our own life experiences, the totality of our life experiences. And when we select judges, we select a person. And a person brings with them a totality of their personality, made up of a variety of different aspects, whether it's womanhood or being Latina, whatever it might be. There's a reason that we choose a person. It's because we respect the life experiences and the guidance that they will bring to these particular issues. Of course, whenever Justice Sotomayor sees a case, she refracts it through her own personal experience. And so why would it be more problematic to think about it this way, think about religion as another aspect of a person's life experience? Why would it be problematic for a person to refract things through religion? Any thoughts about what might be the difference? I think that, that there might be a difference between uh, interjecting your your faith position, your religious doctrine, as opposed to interjecting you, the experiences you've had as a result. Of Good. So it would be wrong to say that I'm going to decide this case this way because canon law decides it this way. But it would be all right for a member of, let's say, a persecuted minority religion to think about things as a minority who has lived through persecution. Would that be a fair way of characterizing that? Yes. Okay. I agree. Many judges agree. Not all judges agree. And I'll show you one particular judge who didn't agree and got in trouble for it. Justice uh, Frankfurter was Jewish. And yet, in one famous law and religion case, he ruled against religious minorities. And he actually got a ton of hate mail. And huge public disapproval. How could a Jewish judge rule against a religious minority? And it, it bothered him deeply. It really did. And to the point that against his colleagues' advice, he wrote this paragraph in the next law and religion case. He wrote, one who belongs to the most vilified and persecuted minority in history is not likely to be insensible to the freedoms guaranteed by our Constitution. Were my purely personal attitude relevant, I should wholeheartedly associate myself with the general libertarian views in the court's opinion, representing as they do the thought and action of a lifetime. But as judges, we are neither Jew nor Gentile, neither Catholic nor agnostic. We owe equal attachment to the Constitution and we are equally bound by our judicial obligations, whether we derive our citizenship from the earliest or the latest immigrants to these shorts. As a member of this court, I am not justified in writing my private notions of policy into the Constitution, no matter how deeply I may cherish them or how mischievous I may deem their disregard. The duty of a judge who must decide which of two claims before the court shall prevail, that of a state to enact and enforce laws within his general competence or that of an individual to refuse obedience because of the demands of his conscience, is not that of the ordinary person. It can never be emphasized too much that one's own opinion about the wisdom or evil of a law should be excluded altogether when one is doing one's duty on the bench. The only opinion of our own, even looking in that direction that is material, is our opinion whether legislators could, in reason, have enacted such a law. Interesting. He would firmly disagree, I would say, with Justice Sotomayor as well. And he would think that it's not correct. But here's something too important to realize. Justice Frankfurter was an outlier for a variety of reasons on this notion, but also because he was self-aware. Think about that. Most judges do tend, according to a variety of studies, which we'll look at in a second, to refract things through their own religious upbringing, understanding, or background. But most aren't even self-aware. In a variety of studies, justices didn't realize that they were doing that until they went through a series of tests that showed exactly how they were, in fact, refracting things through the prism of religiosity. Justice Frankfurter was not only self-aware, he purposely walked away from doing that. He's two steps removed from being the normal judge in this regard. Any opinions? Is that the, what, Who's right here? Justice Sotomayor or Justice Frankfurter? I mean, as for who's right, I don't think that either of them is right because of the fact that uh, both of them are talking about life experiences that inform them in uh, you know, how to understand the parties before them and how important the controversy is. 
Yes. I, I love this quote by Justice Frankfurter. I think it's great. I think um, that, uh, I, and, I, and I really do, I, I'm one of those who really wishes that uh, judges would focus more on doing their job of declaring what the law is by carefully looking at what the Constitution says, what the laws that they're interpreting say, uh, rather than uh, um, trying to bring things in and uh, refocus the Constitution uh, based on things that are outside of it, you know. And so, and, and I like how he's saying that. And I don't think it contradicts at all what Justice Sotomayor is saying. She's just saying, I assume that embodied in what she's saying about being a Latina woman is that she has seen oppression. That's embodied in Frank Ferdinand's dissent too. And she could just as soon insert Latina woman in several of those sentences, although she might have to work around a few of the words and say much the same. But she embraces that diversity in, in Outlook, and she thinks it's good to bring that different style to the table. Is there? Yeah. I think I would summarize it this way. I would prefer to be equal before the law as opposed to being equal before her experience. You know where you stand a lot more when you're equal before the law. Okay, yeah. I have a, a question just because I'm not very familiar with the background of the two quotes that you introduced. Mm -hmm. So the Sotomayor quote, was that from a judicial opinion? No. Okay. And this, it looks like it's from a judicial opinion and it looks like... From his dissent. It's, it's justifying the decision under some kind of rational basis for is that right? No, this was an intermediate uh, scrutiny review. Well, well, in any event, it's just interesting to me. I, my question was where the Sotomayor quote came from. And if it didn't come from an opinion, I wonder about how much it's really in conflict. Well, again, the, the point of the quote was she was talking about how she decides <laughs> cases and what she brings to the table. You, you can't deny the fact that when we appoint judges, we appoint judges based on their worldview, right? It is rare, if not unheard of, to see a liberal president appoint a conservative judge and vice versa. We, it's fairly uncontroversial to say that. And so this is another aspect of that sort of further along the spectrum on that debate is when we appoint someone to be a judge, not because maybe you have two people who are equally qualified with the law, but they bring a different worldview and it's not necessarily bad to recognize that worldview and to be aware of it when you're arguing. Now, a variety of studies have shown that um, judges do, even if they think they don't, do tend to think about things from a religious perspective. The attitudinal model shows how different religious judges or judges from different religious backgrounds tend to think differently about cases. So Catholic judges significantly more likely than Protestant judges to show a liberal voting pattern they're likely to side with injured persons and economic underdogs in non-unanimous cases, in four different types of cases from different studies, criminal matters, divorce settlements, business regulations, and employee injuries. In a different study of 393 cases that are considered the essential gay and lesbian rights cases, Jewish judges were 15% more liberal than Protestants, 26% more liberal than Catholics. The same study found that women and minority judges were also comparatively liberal, which is interesting because it goes back again to our idea about not refracting through religious law, perhaps, but through religious experience or sentimentality. Groups that had experienced oppression, perhaps, women and minorities, were refracting things in similar ways to a religious tradition that might have experienced oppression and so could think about things uh, in the, similar to that Sotomayor type vein. Um, particularly in law and religion cases, to be aware of this. 67 appellate court cases, a study uh, dealing with the Establishment Clause found that Jewish judges vote heavily separationist 82.4% of the time, right? Not 51%, 82.4% of the time, whereas Catholic judges vote heavily accommodationist 84% of the time, and Protestant judges were split. Another study on free exercise found that the single most prominent, salient, and consistent influence on judicial decision making in free exercise cases is religion, and particularly the religion of the judge. Uh, Jewish judges and judges from non-mainstream Christian denominations that define as neither Catholic nor mainline Protestant were significantly more likely to approve of free exercise accommodation requests. Why do you think that might be? I, 
I let's, guess let's it was wait. stating the obvious, but it's yeah. you know, they've seen the oppression. Typically they needed that. Mm hmm Yeah. Do you want me for the mic? Okay. Now, is it, is it okay to really do this? Canon 3B5 of the American Bar Association's Model Code of Judicial Conduct says that judges should perform their duties without bias, and that includes, but not limited to, bias on the grounds of religion. And so the question is, well, we've seen that it happens. The studies are consistent, and they've been replicated multiple times, that it does make a difference. Is that really okay? Well. Statues about when judges should recuse themselves generally do not mention religion, but they do say things about personal bias or prejudice, which could include religious bias. However, as we mentioned, most judges would tell you that they do not, in fact, factor religion in. And then when you show them the studies, or they've gone through a series of tests that a couple of psychologists have developed, and they realize that actually they do tend to vote in the same patterns as their co-religionists, um, they're shocked. And so litigants have asked judges to recuse themselves based on their lawyer's advice on religious grounds in a variety of cases, but most are unsuccessful because the judge will simply say, I'm not religiously biased, and of course I would never affect religion in that way. Yeah? It's kind of a vague question, but I wonder if the association of ways that judges vote with their religion might have... <clears throat> might not necessarily be a direct product of bias, but a product of the ideology of that religion. So for example, my association with other members of the church tends to find that we're mostly strict constructionists, which doesn't necessarily say something about a bias against religion, but perhaps says something about the ideology of the religion. Sure. Mm -hmm. And so the question is, if I ask you to recuse yourself, I think that you're not going to be able to put that ideology aside and look at my case with fresh eyes, you, you'll be able to say as a judge, no, I'll be able to do it, I'll be able to, to think about it clearly, even though I can show you in a variety of cases that everyone from that church tends to read things the same way and it doesn't seem fair. But we tend to give judges um, that, that leeway. And so judges do, in fact, use religion. Sometimes they use it explicitly, and this is where it gets problematic. Sometimes judges cite religion or religious thinking in their opinions. Now, when you're just surveying what religions say, and this comes up a lot in assisted suicide cases or other cases, it's usually not a problem. You can give a little survey of what religious law has to say about a particular uh, problem. But if it's the main or the sole justification, you're subject to reversal. Now, that seems like a good, clean, easy rule. But you'd be shocked at how incredibly um, lenient courts are. So here's one example. In a concurring opinion involving a lesbian mother losing custody of her child on grounds other than sexual orientation, had nothing to do with the fact that she was a lesbian, Alabama's Chief Justice Roy Moore wrote a scathing religious critique of homosexuality, concluding that it, quote, constitutes high treason against the king of heaven. Well, the lawyer said, this certainly should be reversed. I can not believe he even said that. And the opinion was binding because the majority said, well, they reached a decision on their own reasoning, and that's fine, because it was just a little side point that he added in. So in general, the rule is that explicitly invoked religion is allowed to provide a reason, such as being treason against the king of heaven, but not the sole reason. And again, you find purposes, you find reflections and echoes of the secular purpose test from the Establishment Clause cases, which we mentioned is extremely vague and doesn't always work, if you can find some other reason, uh, and it's usually impossible to prove that religion is the only reason or the main reason, so courts have a lot of leeway to uh, inject religion into their opinion. Sometimes they put religion into sentencing, not opinion. So for instance, the ACLU once sued when Judge Thomas Clark of Louisiana gave Gregory Thompson, a 23-year-old convicted of drunk driving, a choice of either jail time or going to church once a week for a year. Uh, the suit was dismissed when probation ended, but the practice does continue occasionally, even to this day. And it comes up much more frequently when courts, when judges sentence people to attend AA meetings, because AA meetings, Alcoholics Anonymous, do have religious or spiritual overtones. And unbelievably, as of now, courts are split on whether or not you can do this. The majority of courts say that you can send a person to Alcoholics Anonymous, so long as you provide them with a secular alternative. So you can either go here or to the Secular Alcoholics Club and otherwise would be an Establishment Clause 
problem. Now, it's important to also realize that sometimes religion, your client's religion, may affect a case that ostensibly has nothing to do with religion. So take a very fascinating case, Wiener v. Wiener. Okay, it was a case in Florida. Uh, it was a it was a mother who adopted a woman adopted uh, a baby girl and then ended up marrying a man who never formally adopted. Now, when they got divorced, the husband said, "Guess what? I'm not paying child support. It's not my natural child, nor is it my adopted child." And it turns out, this was a case of first impression in American law. The attorneys for the parties and the guardian ad litem agree, and the court's own research indicates this is a case of first impression. As to the question of the obligation to support a child by one neither its natural nor foster parent. Ordinarily, the court would not be interested in the religious affiliations or lack thereof of litigants. In this case, however, it has an important bearing on the outcome. The parties are of the Jewish faith. Under the laws of Moses and Israel, the head of every household who takes a child into the household puts himself in loco parenti and is as liable for the support of such infant as though it were his own. That is the codified Jewish law and the Shulchan Arach, the code of Jewish law. And if a person accepts a child into their house, uh, he becomes formally responsible to continue supporting them. Although Orthodox, Conservative, and Reform Judaism may differ in some respects, this is one of the many instances where there is no disagreement and all agree upon the foregoing statement. Both the parties to this action are legally responsible for the support of this child. Primary responsibility is that of the husband. And it uses, really, Jewish law as the basis because there was no other law to apply. That's rare. It happens. But uh, very, very rare that you're going to get a court actually uh, doing that. What does happen, though, and this is much more frequent, is you need to be aware of how your client might be perceived because of their religiosity. So, yes, sometimes fraud is just fraud, but sometimes even just a plain fraud has religious overtones that can really get people quite angry. So, 1974, TV preacher Jim Backer forms a corporation known as PTL Ministries and begins construction on a Christian family retreat center, except that he doesn't. He completely defrauded investors, and in 1989, he was sentenced to 45 years imprisonment and a $500,000 fine. That is excessive, but the punishment reflected a little bit of extra moral condemnation. Those of us who do have a religion are sick of being saps for money-grubbing preachers and priests, wrote U.S. District Judge Robert Potter, prefacing his decision. So, you can't do that. Uh, the Fourth Circuit Appellate Court remanded it for resentencing, and because they found that they had based it on his personal religious principle. Ended up serving four and a half years in a minimum security prison before moving to a halfway house, not 45 years and half a million dollars. But it's important to realize that even something that just, is just a simple case of clear fraud, there are religious overtones and your jury or your judge might in fact be aware of the religiosity and you need to be aware of it um, as well. Now, moving on, I want to talk a little bit about particular instances that come up in law and religion cases. Um, in my day job, I teach at Emory, but I'm also an attorney of counsel to a firm called the American Center for Law and Justice, the ACLJ. Uh, the ACLJ does a lot of work protecting religious freedoms, both domestically and internationally. And as you can imagine, a lot of the young attorneys uh, fresh out of law school that come work at the ACLJ, they're you know, they want to do this work because they are highly motivated, ideologically driven young men and women who want to take a stand and they want to defend religion. And one of the main things that our chief counsel, Jay Sekulow, has to always do is to remind them that you have a client and the case is not about you and you need to advance your client's needs. And sometimes that might mean taking what looks like it could be a great law and religion case, a great chance to stand up for religion and make it not a law and religion case. It might mean abandoning an ideological stance that you desperately wanted to take in favor of an argument that has a better chance of winning. And I'll give you uh, a couple of examples. In the 1990s, the Supreme Court and other courts were striking down public displays of religious materials in schools and government buildings as violations of the Establishment Clause. Now, we could have kept arguing that this is an Establishment Clause issue and these are not Establishment Clause violations, but instead, the ACLJ was instrumental, and really Jay Sekulow was instrumental, in shifting the focus away from religion towards freedom of speech. People were initially very upset that Jay had given up on the religion clauses and was making this now about equal access and free speech. 
But in the end, we won. And the clients were able to keep on doing what they needed to keep on doing. And it's very, very important to remember as an attorney, especially in these kinds of highly ideologically motivated and driven cases, that you're not representing your own ideology, you have a client. And at the end of the day, what you want is to either see reversed or upheld uh, on the decision as per their requirements. Now, the decision to emphasize free speech over free exercise of religion took on a lot of added significance in the past few years after the Supreme Court's decision in Employment Division v. Smith. Prior to Smith, again, the court required government actions that substantially burden religious practice to be justified by a compelling governmental interest. In Smith, however, the court held that the right of free exercise does not relieve an individual of the obligation to comply with a valid and neutral law of general applicability on the ground that the law prescribes or prescribes conduct that his religion proscribes or proscribes. So basically, the free exercise clause lost a lot of its power. And although Congress enacted RIFRA, the Religious Freedom Restoration Act in 1993, to bolster free exercise protections, part of it, as we talked about earlier, was struck down in the court's decision in City of Bernie v. Flores, and now it only applies to actions taken by the federal government. So the freedom of speech has actually become the principal source of protection for religious actors in a variety of cases. And even if the wins are not as, I'll call it, ideologically satisfying as getting a win for religion, they don't make the same kind of statement that uh, a movement might want to make, there's still wins. And if you have to make sure that you're talking to your client and understanding what their needs are, and that particularly comes up again in law and religion um, representations. One of my favorite cases of all time in terms, in terms of thinking about a, an attorney who really knew what his client needed and the best way to get it is Loud CP Italy. And uh, it's a 2011 case. Make a long story short, the Catholic Church in Italy puts crosses in every classroom. And people complain and said that this is infringing upon their religious rights. And so the Catholic Church hired a nice Joseph Weiler, very famous, nice Jewish lawyer from New York, to come before the European Court of Human Rights and to represent the Catholic Church. And he knew that they needed a win. They didn't need to defend uh, their position on the cross. What they needed to do, they didn't want to die on this cross. What they really wanted to do, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help it. What they wanted to do was be able to keep the cross in the classroom. And so he argued brilliantly bringing in the American concept of ceremonial deism that the cross is not actually a religious symbol. Think about that. The Catholic Church hired a Jewish lawyer to come to Europe and argue that the cross is not a religious symbol. It's just a historical symbol of Italy. And he won. Brilliant and completely effective knowing what his client needed, which is to keep the cross in the classroom. So again, uh, as Jay likes to stress, especially in law and religion cases, and this is great because it just shows you the state of law and religion uh, in the world today, very agenda driven, but um, keep your client's needs uh, primary. And the last thing I want to talk about really is what I think is the greatest ethical failing uh, we're experiencing as a country over the last several years, in particular in cases of law and religion, and I want to encourage people to think about these issues very, very carefully. Everyone remembers Hobby Lobby wasn't that long ago. These are the typical Hobby Lobby protest sign, keep your hobbies off my ovaries. People were really upset about Hobby Lobby on both sides of the aisle. People were furious. If you listen to any of the countless uh, media protests, you read any of the thousands of Facebook posts, a typical post would read, so as a corporation, Hobby Lobby has the rights of a person, but as a woman, I don't. And from the other side, people who didn't like Hobby Lobby, if you, if you were against Hobby Lobby, you were against religion. And you were probably trying to throw God out of America. The rhetoric reached unbelievable national uh, levels. And it was, it was sad because I sympathize strongly with the people who really feel like they lost on the Hobby Lobby decision. People who feel so passionately that the Supreme Court got it wrong and they believe that their country and their government let them down. It's a terrible feeling of being disenfranchised, but the righteous indignation towards Hobby Lobby and the court is misplaced. It's not their fault. It's the fault of the lawyers who framed it that way. And it's the fault of the media and the politicians who framed it that way, who overread and over politicized the case to the point of, I think, absurdity. Um, 
be angry at the people who let you believe that a narrow ruling about religious exemptions done in a way that still ensures that women have access to contraceptions mean that the Supreme Court doesn't care about women. It's a, a terrible thing that we do when we over-politicize these cases. The ruling does not allow employers to harass or belittle or deny their employees anything. You know what Hobby Lobby did? It shifted the payment for four out of 20 kinds of contraceptives to a third party. That's what it did. The whole thing. This didn't even need to be any case. It could have just been a simple check mark on someone's administrative box. The fact that it became a national storm that left people feeling disenfranchised on both sides of the aisle says a lot about our particular process and what, what our ethical requirements are as lawyers uh, and as citizen, citizens. Now, again, you know, Kennedy took the time in his concurrence to point out that the entire problem would go away if the government would just chip in for those uh, four types. And the government has a history of helping pay for religious accommodations, whether it's unemployment benefits or military exemptions or even contraception. Everybody could win. This could have been an easy win-win situation following general ideas of courts, religious jurisprudence, where the government chips in for some religious accommodation. It didn't need to be a case at all. But the fact that it became a case and such a terrible case that left people feeling so horrible and so alone is, is tremendously, tremendously sad. And the fact that a discussion about four types of contraceptive payments being shifted to a third party became Roe v. Wade 2.0 tells us that the lesson from Hobby Lobby is much broader than the decision. If we want people to respect courts and what they do, we need to make sure that people understand the issues and that we frame them properly. Otherwise, uh, we end up dividing our country for no reason. And the same thing, honestly, is happening again and again. You know, the recent marriage cases, whether you agree or disagree with the decision, I think the absolute worst thing the court did was to impute animus and to take away the ability to have a discussion about it without making one side into a bigot. There was no need. The court could have gone to the same decisions without having to do that. But it takes away the ability to have civil discourse. And the same things are happening, honestly, around the country in a variety of states over the RIFRA debates. Right? The states are now passing their own versions of the Religious Freedom Restoration Acts and the level of vitriol, the level of rhetoric in a lot of the states, I've worked in the campaigns a lot in Georgia, um, is unbelievable. And you would literally think that anybody who wants a RIFRA, wants a RIFRA so that they can discriminate against others, and who doesn't want a RIFRA is going into churches and burning down uh, whatever they can find. And it's tremendously, tremendously sad that uh, we've let our profession come to this, where we take cases that were, in general, litigation should be the last object, but cases where you could at least have a civil discourse and an engaged public and turn them into national controversies. The preamble to the uh, model rules of professional conduct tells us that as a public citizen, a lawyer should seek improvement of the law, access to the legal system, the administration of justice, and the quality of service rendered by the legal profession. As a member of a learned profession, a lawyer should cultivate knowledge of the law beyond its use for clients, employ that knowledge in reform of the law, and work to strengthen legal education. In addition, a lawyer should further the public's understanding of and confidence in the rule of law and the justice system because legal institutions in a constitutional democracy depend upon popular participation and support to maintain their authority. So the most important thing, honestly, in the ethics of law and religion representation is not even putting your client's needs forward. It's making sure that you frame them in ways that are helpful towards the case and towards the general public. As a lawyer, you need to make sure not to make every small issue into a giant political war. And as a citizen, as a citizen, you need to make sure that you're informed, that you don't just buy into the rhetoric and think that everybody who might disagree with you on a law and religion issue disagrees with you fundamentally and not in a particular specific case. Questions, comments, quips? Uh, I wonder what, what are your thoughts on the recent change of the judicial guidelines in California, specifically not allowing judges um, to serve as judges that um, are affiliated with the Boy Scouts based on their, the Boy Scouts' uh, approach to homosexuality? Um, honestly, I don't know enough about the particular circumstances really to, to offer much in that direction, sorry. Uh, quick question, do you, uh, 
Do you tend to be as separationist as your other Jewish co-religionists? If you were on the bench? Would I tend to be? Um, hmm, it's a good question, probably. Yeah. Short answer, yes. <laughs> There's another question up at the back. Uh, you referenced the subject of judges uh, recusing themselves. It was my understanding in the, that in this recent decision on same-sex marriage, two of the justices in the majority had performed same-sex marriages uh, before uh, engaging in this opinion. Uh, do you think they should have recused themselves or not? Well, again, should have is a, is a strong uh, question here because it was certainly not illegal for them not to recuse themselves, um, I would think yes. I would think that it would have been a, of a higher ethical consideration not to having once already showed their hand in that regard. But again, as a profession that likes to follow the rules, they didn't do anything wrong. And so the question of what, what is ethical if it's not wrong is a, a much deeper question than we have time for here. There's another question in the back. While you're, while you're waiting for the mic, um, Roy Moore, Judge Roy Moore, um, was the same judge who um, allowed the Ten Commandments to stay in... He refused uh, to take them uh, down. Okay. Yes. Um, is there a way to couple that with the, the quote that you showed and, and show that he's just a renegade and a rogue and reverse some of the decision or, or to, to reprimand him in any way? Would that have factored into the decision to reverse him? I'm sorry. Can you, would, His participation in digging in his heels on that Ten Commandment tablet, uh, could that be used uh, against him? Well, he, he lost his standing for a while. He was reinstituted in 2010, I believe. So uh, it, to a certain sense, he lost a lot of, a lot of ground, but it wouldn't reverse his decisions. There was another question. Yeah, I'm just curious, um, because it, it's essentially been a tactic, definitely since the uh, civil rights movements in the 60s, to inflame things um, far beyond um, you know, what you actually hope to get um, in order to have a compromise. Um, so I, I guess, what is your suggestions to keep things uh, in, in a frame that is helpful to the public? I don't think it's a fair comparison, civil rights particularly, uh, with something like um, Hobby Lobby. Because I think it's always important to look at the facts of the case. And I think if you stop people on the street who are angry about Hobby Lobby, actually did this, they would have no idea what the case was about. They would literally wouldn't even understand what RIFRA was. They would think, they would think that it was a First Amendment case when they were wrong, it's a statutory case, they would really actually have no factual basis about why they were angry. And so I think unless you can, if, if, if you can have a grasp on the factual basis and still get that level of anger, maybe there's an issue there that deserves to have anger about it. But if you can frame it in such a way, you know, the only door that was left open in Hobby Lobby was by the dissent, who said this is going to be an incredibly broad decision, it's going to run, ruin things. Had the dissent agreed that it was narrow and was very narrow, um, that would have been it. And lower courts would have been forced to just abide by that. But um, you know, something like the civil rights movement where people are getting tremendously hurt in a variety of ways and the facts on the ground uh, support that kind of indignation, I think is a bit of a different um, category. So the short answer is I think you have to look at the facts of the case before you decide to get angry and not listen to the rhetoric. Well, uh, thank you very much. You did keep us all awake and it's not easy to make uh, ethical discussions interesting, but you did well. Thank you very much.